How's it going everyone? Uh, thanks for tuning in to this video. Uh, before this video begins, I just want to kind of remind you guys or tell you guys if you don't know yet. Uh, I did create a Patreon account. Uh, what Patreon is, is basically a free uh, to post platform with no copyright infringements or restrictions. As many of you know, the Eagles are very uh, restriction prone uh, when I post videos. Um, and they're very strict with the copyright. Uh, with Patreon, though, I can post anything that I want, concert footage, interviews, and, uh, yeah, a lot of people will get to see, uh, concert footage that maybe you've never seen, or a concert, uh, footage of a concert you've been to, uh, a long, to a long time ago. So, yeah, if you want to join that, I'll leave the, uh, link in the description below, and I'll also leave a link on the screen right now. Um, so, yeah, if you want to check it out, come ahead and join over. Some people have already joined. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll be posting two to three times a week, uh, with a bunch of, uh, cool concert footage that maybe you've never seen, like I said before, and, uh, yeah, it's really, I can post whatever I want, um, so yeah, if you want to come over and join, check it out, and, uh, enjoy the video. I'm very happy to have him here for the first time and to talk about music and talk about other issues that concern him. Uh, he is a legend. You are, but d does that register with you? No. You don't think about that? No. What is it you have? Uh, I mean, when you think about the Eagles, first of all, mm -hmm. and when you think about you and all those hits, I mean, yeah. why, what is it, the talent, the gift the, that you have, you think? Well, I'm a collaborator. All those hits were a team effort, and I... I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and meet the right people uh, who were able to bring out the best in me. Um, I, I've often said that I am not a musical island. I'm rather limited in my uh, skills as a musician, but I, I do love words, and I was fortunate enough to have something of an education. I've got three and a half years of college that my parents helped me get, and that has helped me tremendously. Um, in the work. Uh, I don't know, people often ask me, you know, what I think about my place in the music industry, and I, and I don't know because I'm on the inside looking out, and I, I can't really pinpoint it out. A lot of fortuitous things have happened, and it's also the result of a lot of hard work, I think. I mean, I have a work ethic that my mother and father handed down to me. I, I still work about 16 hours a day. Uh, I don't sleep very much. <laughs> and I, I'm sure you can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've yeah. heard, have you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think that all those things combined uh, are responsible for, for whatever I might have achieved. What's interesting about the answer, and it's a great answer, it is this notion of understanding oneself and what it is the skills you have, the love of language. Mm -hmm. you know. I love words. You love words, mm -hmm. you know, and that somehow, if that gives you a certain place to stand yes. and then to find someone you know that that appreciates that and can marry that yes and i also love music i mean i was again i was fortunate uh, growing up because my parents both loved music and were somewhat musical not on a professional level but there was always music in our house there were always records from the time i can remember either 45 rpm records or 78 rpm records uh, my father was in World War II and loved all the big band music of Glenn yeah. Miller and Guy Lombardo and, and the Dorsey Brothers right. and that sort of thing. And my mother played piano after a fashion. And, uh, and I had piano lessons when I was a kid. So there was always music around. My father loved to listen to the radio and my grandfather too. And so I was exposed to it uh, at an early age. And the, the region I'm from is sort of a, a, a crossroads between cultures. I grew up in the northeastern corner of Texas, and so I was exposed to music from the Ozarks. I was exposed to the music of New Orleans. Mm. I was exposed to Western swing from yeah. Texas. I was exposed to blues from a Memphis. rich, rich blues from, well, there's a great blues tradition in East Texas. Yeah. Uh, T-Bone Walker and Scott Joplin were both born in my hometown on farms. Their fathers were sharecroppers. Yeah, so it's in the ground. So it's in the ground. Yeah. When did you know that this might be what you wanted to do? I mean, well, did it choose you or did you choose it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think a little of both. Um, as I said, there were always records in our house, yeah. and somewhere along in the 50s, 
uh, I heard a song on the radio, uh, radio called You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. <laughs> and my mother... Who did that? <laughs> yeah, a fellow named <laughs> Presley. My mother always w made monthly pilgrimages to a larger town where there was a record store. And yeah. she, she brought back 45s. Up until that time, they were mostly kids' records, you know, cartoon-type records and, yeah. and records that she and my dad might like. And one day she asked me if I wanted her to pick up anything in particular. And I said, well, I would like for you to get me a copy of this thing called Hound Dog by this guy named Elvis Presley. And that was my first record. And then I started collecting 45s. You know, then there was, of course, Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats yeah. Domino yeah. and the Everly Brothers and Little Richard yeah. and that whole yeah. genre. Um, and it grew from there. I think when I really decided that this was what I wanted to do was when I saw the Beatles, when I heard and saw the Beatles. Show, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. Oh, yeah. I tell you something, I think you'll understand When I say that something, I want to hold your hand It just struck me. I mean, I loved rock and roll before that time, but there was something on a more, the only word I can think of is a more spiritual yeah. level, something more deep-rooted, and I said, this is for me. This is what I want to do. What I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond just touching you, beyond resonating deeply, you, this is what I want. What to I do. want to do. Yeah. You know. yeah. But what you wanted to do was to play music and sing, right. uh, to write songs. Well, what I really to wanted artists. to do is what all kids want to do. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be popular. I yeah. wanted girls to talk to me. Yeah. Right. You know, that's really why we all get into this in the first <laughs> yeah. place. Well, yes, indeed. You know, I can remember playing football and running along the sidelines, always wanting the play to go to wherever the, the, the girls were standing. <laughs> yeah. That's well, where I wanted my play to go. <laughs> why do men go to war? Because the women are watching. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I was, I was kind of a skinny little kid. I wasn't very athletic. And, uh, and uh, music did it. Music, music gave me a place to stand. Yeah. You know, a place Isn't it amazing now when you. These terrible stories we hear, and I'm, I'm one that's on the front level of, of arguing against victimization, people saying I'm a yes. victim because of all these reasons. Yeah. There's too much of that in our society. But mm -hmm. all these stories of kids using violence to explode this notion that they were ignored, they were picked on, they yeah. were not happy, people didn't notice them, they were not part of the in crowd. Yeah. You know? That's a tough issue because I know how those kids feel. I was picked on. I was beat up. I was. I went to a pretty rough school. Yeah. A lot of pretty rough country boys. In fact, some of the kids in my high school had been in prison and out already. Yeah. And this was before. Uh, yeah. Why would they pick on you? Just because I was little. Yeah. You know, and and I was a sensitive little kid, and I, you know, they thought I was affluent. I, we weren't affluent by any means, you know. Uh, but uh, in relatively speaking, you know, yeah. perhaps. But but it was rough. So I. I understand why kids, uh, people forget what it's like to be a kid, first of all. When we grow up and become adults, we forget how hard it is, especially uh, during those early teen years. Yeah. It's really, really rough. On the other hand, I would have never resorted to taking a gun to school and shooting somebody, you know. I would have, uh, you know. Well, nor would you have read about it somewhere that somebody had done it. No, no. I, and you I, would have seen television showing how Everybody who does that gets all this instant media yeah. glorification. And there were guns in oh, my house. Glorification, but attention. Yeah, there were guns in my house. My father yeah. kept a guns in his closet, and I knew exactly where they were. Yeah. But I never touched them. You know, I just knew that that was something that I didn't want to mess with. And then as I got older, I was taught how to use a, a rifle. You know, I, I wasn't, didn't really become a hunter, but I, I loved to go out and shoot cans. You know, go out to the dump ground and, and shoot a few beer cans or something like that. But. Uh, Guns were a part of, of every household. And I grew up in Texas, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they were just there. But I, I would, it would have never occurred to, um, to me to take one yeah. to school. When did you know that you were, could make it in music? When did I know that when you I... You could make it. In other I words, you it. could make a living, that you were going to be okay, <clears throat> that you had found a place. You got traction, you might say. Traction, yeah. Um, I think around... Well, you never know in the music business. You, you know, traction one day. Even after this, you're not sure. Yeah, traction one day, no traction the next. You know, these days, one album is a career. Yeah. You know. Um, one album is a career, meaning? Meaning that a lot of careers are very... Oh, limited to one album. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, short. You can't live off to one album for a... No, you, you never take it any permanence for granted. Right. 
in this business. That's uh, why you work 16 hours a day. That's it, why you keep par at it. Partially. Um, I don't remember when I got comfortable with the idea. I, th I don't think it was till the Eagles' third or fourth album, you know, yeah. around 74, 75. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, because... I mean, that's when you realize that I'm, I'm in this for life. I mean, this is what I yeah. do. I'm a musician, I'm a star, I'm a songwriter, and people want to listen to my music. Yeah. But we knew the, all the time that it was that it could go away at any minute. I mean, our, our, the entirety of our second album, The Desperado, even then, that every day that you live, you're also dying, you know, and yeah, that, that right. the, the end would eventually come. Yeah. It lasted a lot longer than any of us ever suspected. Yeah. We were all amazed at the longevity of it. And how, how hard was it when it came to end in 1980? Well, it was hard. It had gotten difficult. Uh, it had been difficult the whole time. There was always somebody quitting or somebody getting thrown out or something. <laughs> you know, the whole thing was hard. Or somebody jealous or somebody. Yeah, they, I don't know if people know the difficulty of keeping a group together. I, I suppose that in any type of business, working in a group context is difficult. But when you're with four or five creative people who all have minds of their own, it's, it's just <laughs> really something. Um, Were you the leader? No. Were you first among equals? Well, neither. Uh, you're just saying that? Glenn, Glenn Fry and I were, I, I guess for all intents and purposes, the co-leaders of right. the group. And for a while we tried to run it as a democracy and then it became a benevolent dictatorship, <laughs> uh, which most groups do. I mean, yes. the, the Rolling Stones, the, right. the Beatles, uh, right. you know, you, I'm, I'm not comparing this to those groups, but that you usually end up with one or two people who are sort of calling so the shots. So Lennon and McCartney and, and Jagger and Richards or? Well, yeah, again, I'm not comparing us to those guys. But no, I'm I understand, but I mean, a, we'll give there's a pattern. Them, but there's a pattern, yeah. you know. Um, At some point, somebody has the instinct for leadership, somebody has the juice, it's and usually somebody. The, yeah, usually the people who write the songs. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> we, uh, but it was the last. That's true. <laughs> the last three years were very difficult from, from yeah or the last two years, from 78 to 80, things were just coming apart. Why? Just for all those reasons? Well, pressure. We, we didn't get a break. We just went nonstop through the 70s. Um, the incredible sales of Hotel California, that enormous success. Every group has a zenith. Yeah. You know, every, every group has a peak, a creative peak, uh, a sales peak, and that was ours. And then comes the pressure of trying to repeat that because you feed the machine that is the record business and the machine, the monster wants more. The monster constantly needs feeding. Mm -hmm. and, and you get caught up in this whirling vortex of success and money and f fame and pressure. And, and, it, and then, of course, drugs were involved. We were all doing what everybody was doing at the time. And that helped to hasten our demise, I think, because it, it interfered with our ability to be objective it interfered with our ability to get along with one another. Tempers were short. Um, insecurities were on the surface. Um, did you know that at the time or, and ignore it, or did you get smart because of therapy or something? No, I think we knew it instinctively at the time, but we didn't really do anything about it. Uh, now, some groups like Aerosmith were, were very clever about that sort of thing. They hired a group therapist. Uh, <laughs> That's you know, the secret. Yeah, a group therapist. A group therapist. Um, just, but we... I could just see it now, coming <laughs> off and saying, I just feel bad. Can we talk? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it worked. Um, but, you know, in that role for us was our manager and our record producer. They, yeah. Our record producer was the referee, yeah. and our manager was the group therapist, but all managers, there are very few managers that will really tell you what you need to hear because they want to continue to be your manager. <laughs> and they, yes. they don't want to rock the boat. I mean, our manager was more, was more candid than most, I think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we were adults. Uh, we were of age, and I, I think, you know, people feel limited somewhat into in, in what they can say to to a very successful artist who is over the age of 21. Mm. Um, but in hindsight, you know, which is always 2020, we, uh, we realize now that... You were that destroying was, yourself. That was part of the problem, yeah. yeah. On the other hand, we were 
fairly prolific and creative in spite of all that. You know, we managed. Yeah, that's amazing. A lot of other people have been too. Yeah. And, we and, and the question only is one: How do you do that? And but our other question, I guess, is how much more prolific and spectacular would you have been if you weren't? Well, that's a question I've pondered often, and I don't know the answer. Maybe, maybe no more at all. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, I think the group might have stayed together longer and we might have been able to make another album or two, but I think what happened to us would have eventually happened regardless of our habits. Uh, I, I think it happens as a matter of course. Um, so, yeah, the important thing is that we're all still alive and relatively healthy. A lot of our peers didn't make it through that time, through the 60s or the 70s. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm extremely grateful for, that I got to come out the other end of the yeah. tunnel and uh, enjoy the life that I have now. Among those that didn't get to the other end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. which was the most tragic for you? Taxi in New York, where mm -hmm. were you? I was at home in Los Angeles in, in the living room in, in front of the television. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that had the most profound effect on me. Because it was so, what? Well, two reasons, because he had been so important to me in my right. life musically and is sort of a, a hero figure of mine, musically speaking. Um, and because the Beatles music had, had been one of the catalysts to get me to where I was. And also because it was so senseless. Mm -hmm. you That's know, what I was going to say, senseless. It wasn't anything that he did. I mean, he didn't overdose or anything. It was just some some tragic uh, incident. You know what I always wonder about Lennon too beyond that is I always assume as I do about Richard Burton for example, mm. another genius, yeah. that he made the choices about lifestyle that he made and you can't mm -hmm. quarrel with that. You can't say he no. didn't maximize his talent because it was his talent to maximize. Right. Right. Yeah. But you still think about it, you know. Yeah. What might that person have done yeah. who really had something, yeah. a gift? Well, you know, the people who study these things tell you that that's part of genius, a little bit of insanity, yeah, bad, uh, go. bad habits. Uh, it's part of the, there's a wonderful book called Meeting the Shadow and it talks about, you read that, it talks about the dark, the creative yeah. side of right. the personality and, and our destructive side is, goes hand in hand with our creative side, you know, our, the, the, the dark elements, our senses of humor, mm. all those things. So I think every person who is brilliant creatively is, is a little uh, off. <laughs> That's your experience? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you? Uh, I've be, I like to think of myself as uh, pretty normal, but I know that I'm not. Uh, I, I <laughs> and that. how does it manifest itself, but I'm, you know, the, the abnormality? Oh. <clears throat> excesses. The excesses. Which I'm, which I'm well past now. Right. Um, that was it primarily. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm temperamental, or it can be if I get tired, if I don't get enough sleep. It's the main thing for me <laughs> is sleep. Uh, other than that, I'm pretty normal. I mean, I, yeah. I have a, uh, you know, I go to the supermarket, I go to the post office, I go fill the car up with gas, I make pancakes for the kids. On How many kids? Three. And they're with you? N not at the moment. Yeah. But yes, I mean, I, yeah, we live. You see them all the time. I mean, oh, yeah. living in the house. Yeah, yeah you absolutely. See, you know, you see them on the weekends. No, we're we're a, a very happy family. Um, how long can you do this? The music. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're I, getting ready, which I'm going to talk to in a moment. Yeah. To have the Eagles back on tour. Mm hmm I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the the. <laughs> The line keeps moving. <laughs> yes, it you does. Know? You thought I, maybe 40, then you thought... Well, I used to think 30. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's the famous quote by Mick Jagger about <laughs> not imagining, you, you know, know, that uh, doing this after 30. Yeah. And I, I thought that in my 20s, too. I mean, and Jagger's about 57 now. Uh, yeah, something. he's older than I am yeah. and still going strong, I guess. And he also, it says something about him, actually. I think that says something. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he, for all of, of the good living that he has done, <laughs> <laughs> in a way that you and I can appreciate, mm. uh, he has clearly you know, taken care of himself with yes. respect to understanding the demands mm -hmm. of continuance. In yes. other words, he said, look, if I want to continue this, I've got to do certain, make certain yeah. kinds of concessions, too. No, he's pretty amazing in that respect. You know, yeah. he, he, it's some, something that I, I stand in awe of. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have to do the same thing, though? I mean, if you're going to continue to have a career in music, yes. you've got to make sure that you, yeah. you, you and I do. take care and I do. of the instrument, et cetera. Yes. I, I, uh, I don't have any, any habits anymore. Yeah. I mean, it, no alcohol, no drugs. Yeah. Uh, I work out religiously. Yeah. Uh, Eat well. But that's not only because of this, but that's because I have a family now. Right. And that, that's more of a motivation, motivator than even my career. You have a responsibility to people other than yourself. E exactly. And I always did, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I, take, I have my mother still living, and I take care of her. She's 84 years old. And, uh, She's in good health? Reasonably uh, so? Reasonably so. And what does she think about her son, the rock and roll star? Um, she's very proud, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> she, she doesn't read tabloids, though. Over no, the years, no, did no. She? she she lives in the small town where I grew up, and her her knowledge of of my life is somewhat limited, and, and I don't. She's never grasped right. the whole thing, but she's extremely proud, and and I give her a lot of credit for you know getting me started because she never argued, nor did my father, with what I wanted to do, and she bought me my first set of drums without telling my father, and then stopped back by his store on the way home and said. And they were in the trunk, and she opened the trunk, and she said, "This is what I've done." And he went, Good "Okay, for her, yeah." You know, see, I admire that initiating it and doing it, and then yeah. said, "Look what I've done," rather than saying, "Can I go get drums for yeah. no, young she Don?" Just did it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then told him, and then tell him. And then yeah. he was fine with it. Yeah. But getting back to your question about how long this will last, yeah. it's already lasted three or four times longer than I ever imagined, mm -hmm. and it just keeps going. You know, but I really want. It's important to me to know when. To step away, I want to step away with some dignity, and I don't want to be some old codger running around looking foolish. You know, I don't want to be the last guy at the party with, you know, with the lampshade on my head. I want I want to get off the wave just before it crashes onto the shore, to yeah. use a surfing analogy. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I hope that I'll know when that is. As long as the creativity, as long as the songwriting is the key to everything. As long as the material comes in, and Lord knows there's plenty to write about. Yeah. As long as you can keep it whole at the core, exactly, you'll be okay. Exactly. You no, know? I mean that's really what drives. It. Too many people worry about all the other stuff. You know, I want to, and they don't get it right at the center. Yeah. And if they don't have it right at the center, it's never going to be precisely good, either in terms of height or in terms of yeah. depth. And, and speaking of all the other stuff. Uh, that's a problem today because mus the music, the pop music industry has become more and more about the other stuff yeah. rather than the core of the music, rather than from the heart. It's much more of a business, a corporate business now. And I don't like what I see. And I've talked about it a lot in the press. I, I know you have, but what's your complaint? <clears throat> My complaint is the corporatization of the industry. Now, to be perfectly honest, the music industry has always been corporate. But in the, in the 60s and the 70s, it was much less corporate and global than it is today. It was run by people like Jerry Wexler and Ahmed Erdogan and Herb Alpert and uh, Mo Austin and, mm. and Lenny Warrecker right. and people who had a deep love and understanding of music and the history of music. Right. Today, uh, even though some of those same people are still involved, um, the decisions come down the corporate ladder. The business is run by bean counters and, and CEOs uh, of companies that are usually located abroad. Warner Brothers is the only major American record, American-owned record company left in the business, which is fine, I suppose. I mean, rock and roll is for everybody. Right. But there was more of a familial feeling. It was more of a family in the old days. It was less cutthroat. Yeah. You knew who the boss was. You knew where he was, and. Uh, record companies were were not just some little arm of a great big octopus, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I tell you what else they had. They also had a paternal yeah. instinct too. Yes, there was a sense of these are my artists, right? You know, and, and they, they would identify with the artist and with their lives and yes. with the music, and they wanted to see at the concert and they wanted to invest. They know, would take an artist who wasn't necessarily popular, and they would nurture that artist right. and stick with that artist until that artist matured artistically. And it paid off a lot of times. But Mo Austin's still around. He's still around. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, you know, today it, it's just gotten so big 
and so remote um, that artists, I think, feel more like commodities, you know. Uh, was, was the decision for the Eagles to come back mm -hmm. a commercial decision, a musical decision, or something else? I think it was all, all those things. Personal behavior, whatever, people yeah. wanted to do it.